Insight Core Experienced, Episode 5, recorded June 19th, 2015. Welcome to Sitecore Experience. Sitecore Experienced, a video podcast to showcase information related to Sitecore for the benefit of the Sitecore community. Mr. Mark Survey, welcome back to another episode of Sitecore Experienced. Episode 5, man. Here we are. So, today we have another, hopefully, wonderful episode planned for you. Um, Our first four episodes have included some of the brightest uh, minds in the Sitecore community. And we still have Uh, many more to go, to be quite honest, with all the minds. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh... MVPs who certainly know the depth of Sitecore and and graced us with some of that knowledge and shared it with us. Um, Today, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different in that we're going to back up and do an overview of Sitecore uh, for a target audience that's maybe not as familiar with the product, or I should say the platform, more on that later. Um, And it's going to be a... conversation between you and I to, to talk about this today. And more um, my smart assery. Yes. Some, uh, it's a conversation I look forward to, though, always. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So hopefully uh, people enjoy that. Um, and hopefully people who maybe don't know Sitecore but have somehow stumbled across our little uh, slice of heaven here can learn something. Um, until then... Let's jump on it. All right, so what's happening in the Sitecore community recently? Uh, Craig Taylor, a Sitecore MVP, recently posted this about a bug he found in Sitecore 8 where if you set an anchor tag to Active Browser, it literally puts in the words Active Browser um, as your target. Yeah, (laughs) that was literally my thought. Whoops. Um, The great news is he's got a workaround for you. So if you've encountered this, check out Craig's blog. He's got a fix for you. Yep, and we'll post it below, as always. Always. Next up, this news is, ooh, hot off the presses. Literally today. Today. So, Sitecore has selected NetBiscuits for device detection. Uh, This uh, blog post here talks about how Sitecore will be using NetBiscuits device detection library to give the most accurate uh, details of what devices visitors are viewing the sites off of. Um, So, if you're doing adaptive design, this sounds like it's going to be more accurate for you in the near future. All right, in the past week, uh, Brian Peterson has put out this lovely blog blog, blog post about extending the field renderer. Um, I highly suggest that if you are new to Sitecore, you take a look at this. Um, He kind of goes through basically the ins and outs of, of just the basic construction of this, how to do this, and goes through a little example of what he's done for a simple extension from a, a kind of a beginning end concatenation, if you will. Very cool. Yeah, it it, it you know these these uh, articles are in in Brian Peterson's always been one of those guys when I started out that you know I found a lot of information. Absolutely, um, Brian is definitely one of my favorite writers on Sitecore. Then we go on. And to master Sitecore. Now, Martina has um, on Twitter, Martina Wielander has on Twitter uh, posted essentially that she's got a couple new videos up. And you can see them in the shared version, unversion fields, and the icons field titles. So check these out. What I'm really jealous about, Jamie, is she posted a picture on Twitter of her little recording area. And you're looking, well, I got two recording areas, right? Mm-hmm. I have the one that you see here which is crap. It's not even really a recording area. Let's really be honest. I got flat screens in front of me. It's horrid. Downstairs, I have more crap, and that's really for music and sound recording and stuff like that, right? So it doesn't really fit the video thing good. Eventually, depending on how my holidays go, 
I think I'm actually building a studio outside. Whoa. I, I think it's going to happen. Fancy, fancy. It's going to be an office studio, but no more, you know, towels over boards, stuff like that. Well, they're still going to have to suffer through my uh, living room. Sorry. Uh, well, you got to <laughs> you got to build a shutout back and just go hang out out there, one of those little pods, <laughs> to do the podcast. And you don't have a basement, I know that. You're in Southern California. It's true. There, there's no such thing. Yep. Well, there there might be, but I don't. Why would you? Um. So check out the videos that Martina put together. Um, they sound excellent. Because of that rig that she's got set up. So everything's all good. Um, definitely good information here. Especially what they're trying to do here at the whole Master Site Core. Um, learning experience. We talked about last episode about new developers. We're going to mention a little bit about Site Core today. In that conceptual space, if you will. All right, so Marketplace finds, Jamie, a lot of great, interesting things. Well, you're going to talk about two things that are highly important and highly popular. Yep. This one, not so popular, but it did catch my eye. Um, very, very recent, I think April. Yeah, April is when the release date is on this. And what caught my eye about this is it's like additional publishing. It's like, well, what more do I want to publish, right? Mm -hmm. But this has, if, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, it has some really good features on it about publishing deleted items and, and really kind of publishing my items, which really is another comparison of publishing queue and the updated by the current site core user. So you're really only truly getting the current user's items published. So this is a nice little add-on. I have not tried this out. Um, I, was, I actually loaded it, Jamie. But then mm -hmm. it recorded, so I didn't get a chance to try it out. If you're in an environment where you have more than one content author um, chugging away, I can see this being very valuable oh, to the, you. The Publish My Items is sweet. Absolutely. You know, just, just the concept of that. So. I've got literally the one and three in most downloaded um, modules on the marketplace both received recent updates. So number one is Sitecore Instance Manager. It was updated just yesterday as of the day we're filming this. Um, so if you're using this, if you are one of the very few who are not yet using this, go check it out. It's got an updated version. I was, uh, I was actually using this the other day uh, for Sitecore 8 Update 3. And it didn't quite work out for me like I expected, and I know there's some <laughs> there's some issues. So hopefully this uh, latest fix will will solve my problems. Well, you'll have to let us know in a future episode. I will. Then the other item that on the same exact day got a uh, update is the PowerShell extension. So our last episode we had Michael West as our featured guest. Um, in a future episode, we are expecting to have Adam come on and talk about, um, most likely Adam will talk about what this update included in PowerShell extensions. Um, but, you know, again, if you're using this, if you're not using it, but you're curious, um, well, quite honestly, if you're not using it, but you're curious, go watch our last podcast. Yeah, um, go use it. I mean, yeah, and then I've, go use it. I actually tried this out. Oh, impressive. Yeah, dude. Yeah, See, dude, I'm it, on that. it pays to come and talk to us because then we'll use your yeah. product. Well, yeah, then I'll use it. And what does that really mean to anybody? <laughs> Nothing. But no, no, the cool thing is, you know, we were we were given we were given a schooling by yes. Mr. Michael West last episode. And uh, you know, I went I went to go check it out after. I'm like, yeah, I, this looks like it saved time and, and energy and I just don't want to be full of <laughs> when I go do this. Yeah, I went and tried it. I like it. I mean, I got to get better at using it and, you know, not yep. just play around with it and actually do good stuff with it. Um, but, you know, looking at this, that list of contributors is getting longer and longer, isn't it? Yes, and it's kind of a who's who, isn't it? A little bit. A little bit. Very you good. Know? Very cool. So it's good to see some updates happening with some uh, very popular modules. Keep that up as well. And... We're still looking for new modules out here. Yeah, if you guys have modules you want us to showcase, because this is not exactly the easiest list to start combing through. <laughs> There's not a great feed 
to be able to go, oh, what's been happening in the marketplace? Yep. And not. We, we dig through this one. So if you got something new and interesting you want us to showcase and look at, throw us, a, throw us an email. Throw us, throw us an email. Our guest has been working with Sitecore since 2009 and has earned his MVP every year since 2013. A Philadelphia native now living in San Diego, our guest is a fan of toys, video games, and comic books. Sitecore experiences own co-host, Jamie Stump. Jamie, welcome. (laughs) Thank you. It's uh, great to be here, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) It's not like like you went anywhere. uh, This is true. Uh... So, that was an awesome intro. I didn't even know you were going to give me an intro. Yeah. Um, but this is certainly uh, going to be a, group, uh, a conversation between you and I. Um, as I mentioned in our intro, we've had brilliant people on the show mm-hmm. uh, so far. And all of our topics have been very deep into technical things you can do with Sitecore, which is awesome, and we love it. Um but we want to make sure that any audience can can sort of listen to our show and and get something out of it. So we're taking leaps and bounds back, and today we're just going to do an overview of Sitecore um, for people who have maybe heard of it, maybe just recently heard of it, but haven't gotten their feet wet with it yet. Think of it as an introductory topic. Absolutely, absolutely, and what we... What we hope to do with this is um, have it be one of an ongoing series um, where we get people into Sitecore. And sort of, Mark, you really sparked this um, in our last episode, mentioning how, you know, we as a community want to embrace new developers, whether they're completely new young kids looking to become developers or just developers who've been outside of Sitecore who are looking to get into it. And so we're hoping that this series um, successfully accomplishes that goal of of bringing more people into our community. It's a community you and I both love um, and are very happy to be part of. And so we want to certainly share that. Um, So it it is the first of a series. That being said, we we certainly don't expect it to be consecutive series. We're going to space these out. Um so that we get a, a range of topics, business, technical, deep, um, and, and this series as well. Very good. And we want uh, more Walmart greeters converted into site core developers. <laughs> Can we jump into it? Let's get into it, man. Okay. All right. So let's start at the very absolute beginning. Hey, what is Sitecore? Sitecore is an enterprise-level content management system. It has been named a leader in the market by Gartner. So what does that mean? I mean, if you know the market at all, you can pretty much say content management has saturated the web market. There's everywhere you turn, you can find a different product, um, a a lot of which are very good. Um, Some are designed for smaller shops. Some are designed for enterprises. Sitecore... I would say has grown into an enterprise level content management system where, um, you know, going back maybe five, six years ago when I first started working with it, it was maybe, it was in a few enterprises, but it was more of a mid-market thing. Um, And lately it's really focused on the enterprise and added features that are very enterprise level um, features. So that's where, that's what what's at the heart of Sitecore, right, is the content management piece of it. That's where it all started. Yeah. Um, what what makes it a leader? Why would it be differentiated from, as I mentioned, the, the gluttony of things that are in this market? Well, it's really its integrated digital marketing functionality, right? So Sitecore's taken the, Sitecore, the organization, has taken the approach of, other than just doing base content management very well, we want to have we want to offer capabilities to digital marketers, um, which in this day and age is really important. And 
instead of sort of some some software out there take the the stance of well we'll give you a bunch of different modules or you can pick and choose from a bunch of third party things and sort of piecemeal it all together Sitecore said we're going to build it right into our base product you're going to have one interface that you know and that you can do everything from um, so what kind of functionality are we talking about? You can see here on the screen we're talking about content personalization, both explicit and implicit. So um, I'll jump back to what those mean in a second. We've got A, B, or multivariate testing capabilities, qualitative analytics reporting, email campaign capabilities. So if you want to send a monthly newsletter, you can do that. If you want to do some trickle campaigns based on events that your customers meet, you can do that. Um, and further things that are in the digital marketing realm. Um, jumping back real quick to the content personalization, I say both explicit and implicit. And, you know, depending on where you're at in the spectrum of digital marketer, you may know exactly what I mean or you may have no idea. So um, explicit is something that you absolutely you as an organization absolutely know about your visitor right so let's say i have a website that requires a login once you log in i give you a profile and maybe i ask you what your favorite baseball team is and since everyone's favorite baseball team should be the phillies that's what people say and for the few people who don't love the Phillies, we can say, oh, you aren't a Phillies fan, we'll, we'll personalize the menu for you. I got some or, questions for you on that. Um, aren't, the <laughs> Phillies, aren't the Phillies in last place right now, like, ever? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, um, and, and I don't know, I, I don't follow baseball, right? So, um, and they're even worse than the Brewers, right? They are worse than the Brewers okay, right now. I know there's, I know there's a thing going back and forth for who's the worst, but <laughs> we hold that crown right now. We're the best at something, even <laughs> if it is being the worst. I just wanted to make sure because you yes. know you could have picked a winner <laughs> to do the demonstration with instead of I, the Phillies. I could have. Ah, yeah, I'm a, ah, I'm a Phillies fan at I, heart, right? I know. Oh, I, get, I get it. I'm not a Brewers fan, so I could give a crap. Right. So again. The whole point, whether you're a Phillies fan or a Padres fan or an Evil Empire fan, the point is the site visitor explicitly told you, this is who I'm a fan of, and you can now take that data and personalize their experience based off of it. The converse to that is implicit personalization. So now the scenario is, I have a visitor that I really don't know much about. But that visitor is navigating and browsing through my site, and based on how they're doing that, I might be able to make some assumptions. For instance, if they go to uh, the Philly site, and then the Padres site, and then the Yankees site, and then the, the Philadelphia Eagles site, I might say, well... This person's clearly a sports fan, but they seem to be more interested in baseball than football based on how they're browsing my site. So I can start personalizing the um, the experience for them based on, I think you like baseball more. You haven't told me that explicitly, but implicitly through your behavior, that's what I'm guessing. Um, Sitecore can do both of those things through a built-in rules engine, which is really powerful and extensible and really cool. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's been named a leader um, in the market of web content management. Um, the one thing, and I don't want to get off on too big of a tangent, um, but personalization, when you, when you talk about personalization, I always like to tell people to make sure they understand the difference between personalizing and more of like lock <clears throat> excuse me locking out or doing security things so the point of personalization is not to keep visitors away from anything but it's to drive them towards what they're interested in in the first place right as a visitor we all know in this day and age everyone's time is a scarce resource scarce resource and um 
we want to make sure that if you've taken your time to visit our website, you get what you're looking for as quick as possible. Personalization can help that by driving you to what it is you're already looking for. So that's the point. Not The point is not, oh, stay away from this because you might not be interested in it, right? Um, again, not to go off on a too deep of tangent, but to me that's a really important thing for people to understand. Um, so then the last bullet point here and what is Sitecore is... It's, uh, it's an extensible framework that's, that allows custom code, and it's also got free or paid modules that you can add um, that are developed by the community. Um, we've, we, every episode, we talk about some modules that are out there on the marketplace mm -hmm. um, that people can add to their Sitecore experience, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and <clears throat> those keep multiplying as we go through things. So now that we know a little bit about what Sitecore is, what technologies are it built? Is it built on? So it's built on the .NET platform for code. Um, it has both web forms and MVC pieces at this point. Um, web forms sort of dating back, and MVC being more of the newer stuff. Uh, in the back end, it's got it's got SQL Server databases for content storage. It can use an Oracle as the database server if that's desired uh truthfully i've never uh seen that in practice um but you could if you needed to or wanted to um in the newest version so starting at site core 7.5 and going up there's also a mongodb component for the analytics data collection again that has to do with the integrated marketing capabilities um it's built on IIS for your website hosting, and it comes with uh, Lucene as its default content and indexing engine. All right, so now that I know what Sitecore is, what do I have to do to get this on a machine, right? So what's the installation process? Well, the good news in my mind is Sitecore provides a EXE installation file that is basically a wizard that walks you through it. Um, personally, that's my preferred method of installing Sitecore. I know other implementation partners dis, um, go for more manual means, which are available to you. Yep, and um, uh, Sim as well is out there. So the uh, Sitecore speaking instance of module. modules. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and you know the manual methods. There's there's like a zip file that you can unzip, and you can put the files in the directories yourself, and then create your own app pool and your own IIS website and whatnot. Um, to me, again, personally, I just think the EXE, it works, it's quick, it's easy, um, so that's my favorite. Um, if you are going to go the, the route of installing Sitecore, what do you need? for the This is for the latest version, at least. So you need a full version of IIS. Um, you need the .NET Framework 4.5, you need a valid Sitecore license file to get through the installation, and you need some sort of uh, database for the backend storage. So when you run through the uh, installer, you're given a few options. Do you want to install complete or front-end only or back-end only? What that basically means is on a machine, you can have it be both the web server and the database server. Um, this is... Personally, my recommendation for like developer machines, they can kind of run everything um, because their sole purpose is to work for the developer and they're not going to get traffic. Front end only would be your web servers um, and back end only be your database servers. Best practice, we would say, um, certainly if you're an enterprise, you want to split those servers out so that you do have separate front end from back end. Um, and then after you're done the Sitecore installation, you then do the MongoDB installation separate from Sitecore. Um, and there's a lot of docs out there about how to do the MongoDB. I'm certainly not an expert on it, but having gone through it a number of times, um, to me, I'm not sure that the MongoDB installation really has anything to do with Sitecore. I guess it does um in right you're just you're basically running through a vanilla mongodb installation separate from sitecore 
Well, yeah, it's definitely its own entity, right? That that Sitecore is utilizing as right. a tool within the arsenal, um, and a very good tool, by the way. So, yes. you know, it, it really comes down, and this is why we have partners um, for Sitecore. So, you know, the, the separation of servers, even how you want to set up MongoDB, you should really talk to a Sitecore partner to get a really good architectural overview and design set up for what you need. Because everybody's needs are a little bit different. Yep. And doing this for a while, we all know that no company is like the other company. Otherwise, we'd be buying the same thing, wouldn't we? So yep. um, definitely starting out and setting up things and having thinking about performance, thinking about just bottlenecks in general, thinking about a lot of different things really need to be, needs to be taken in consideration. Even with Mongo, um, kind of doing a quick install of Mongo is great a lot of times for development machine, but you have to think that your analytics is going to grow. So now you need to start thinking yep. about how you're going to scale that out, how that's going to extend. Do you need more enterprise features um, than what the typical non MongoDB enterprise is offering. So there's a lot that goes into that uh, that needs to be really drawn out in discussion with with your company. Um, Sitecore partner will do that. And um, at that point, you really need to think about how the pieces come together, good fundamental building blocks to hit goals. So absolutely. Okay. Uh, speaking of, I just realized I said absolutely. And having watched a few of our episodes now, I feel like someone might be able to develop a drinking game for how many times I say absolutely in a single uh, Now you just issued a episode. challenge. There you go. The first Sitecore Experience drinking game. I'm sure there'll be more to come. <laughs> uh, in, fact, in fact, I got a feeling probably toward the end of the year we'll have our own drinking game as we do Sitecore Experience. <laughs> I, I sort of wonder how many people need to drink just to get through some of our episodes. Yeah, we don't get a lot of comments, so I'm thinking people are pretty wasted by the time they get out of the topic. <laughs> They're yelling at their computer, You're not right! <laughs> what do you think? You're an well, idiot! Well, well, here's what I have to say to those people. Happy it's drinking great, time? It's no, no, no. It's great that you're yelling at your computer, but give us that feedback. If you think I'm an idiot, right. please tell me. Makes, I would Do it I sober, would, though. You know, I don't uh, want drunken yeah. feedback. <laughs> Saying yes. things about my sister and my mother. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Let's get back on. Oh, uh, yes. All right. So now I've just installed Sitecore. Well, what do I get with it? All right, so what, are you, what you're going to get are some SQL Server-based databases. Again, this assumes you chose SQL Server as your backend. Um, you're going to get a – and this is – the for this conversation, this is per installation. So if you think of it as an environment-based installation, so if I install this on dev, I'm getting everything mentioned here on my dev environment. So you're getting a, a number of databases, a core database – that stores internal site court content. It's also got the .NET membership tables included with it. That's just your vanilla .NET membership tables. Um, you get a master database, which we would refer to as the content managed or CM database. This is when um, business users use Sitecore and are entering and updating content into it. They're directly doing this against the master database. That's where all that content is getting saved. Then you have a web database, which is referred to as a content delivery or CD database. This is the data that should be, or the content that gets published for public consumption in whichever environment you're talking about. Um, the separation of those is a big deal, right? Master versus web, because it sets up the ability to look at something on master, prove that it is what you want before you actually publish it out to your web for public consumption. You also get your analytics database. Now in SQL, with the newest versions of Sitecore, 
The analytics database is actually an aggregated collection of analytics data, and it's used for reporting purposes. Then you have a sessions database. If you want to use SQL Server session management, you certainly do not have to do that, um, but you do have a, table, a database there if you want to. In addition, you also get the MongoDB collections. These collect the analytics database as your visitors are, are perusing your site and browsing through your site. It's collecting the data. Um, so this is doing really the, the real-time heavy lifting, and the analytics database in SQL gets aggregated data um, so that your SQL server that's serving up content to visitors is not under a huge amount of strain um, or load where it can't function based on the millions and billions of analytic things that are going across the wire all the time. So, Jamie, let's say I was born under a rock yesterday. Okay. And I don't want analytics because I have issues. Okay. <laughs> so... If I have issues and I don't want analytics, what are my options? Okay, well, if you don't want analytics, you can certainly configure Sitecore to not use it. Um, and and you can basically turn it off, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, there's undoubtedly clients on Sitecore having a wonderful experience who are not using analytics. I can say that 100% truthfully. Um, I'm also fairly confident in saying they're missing a large part of Sitecore in that behavior. Right? I agree. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. So you get more than just some databases and some collections with Sitecore, right? What else do you get? Well, if you went through the route of um, using the installer EXE, or if you did the manual route to the full completion, you're going to end up with a configured IIS website and an app pool to run that website, right? Um, you're also going to get .NET-based API and configuration files. The API is delivered via multiple DLLs. Um, there's an extensive amount, I'd say, of DLLs, um, so functionality split across them. Um, you're also going to get a, about 70 config files with the web config alone, including about 4,000 lines. So for developers who've maybe only worked with homegrown .NET websites and maybe their config is... I don't know, maybe a thousand lines, and that's probably giving them a lot of extra lines. Um, it can be somewhat shocking to mm -hmm. all of a sudden install this and say, whoa, look at all these files. Um, and if the, you're, you're one of those folks, one of those companies that had a lot of app settings in your web config, and you're upgrading to, let's say, eight, Get ready for some patch files. You either need to extend the size in IIS to be able to hold that config file, or you're going to need to parse it out. Um, yep. I suggest the latter, quite personally. Absolutely. And you'll notice it almost immediately when you're doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And so the the good news, you, you brought up patch files, and I think we'll talk about them in a, a little bit later on this, but the good news is... While you get a, an abundance of configuration files right out of installation, they are assembled in a general, generally pretty well manner. Um, and the patch file system is really, really a cool thing that Sitecore provides you um, to sort of do overrides to your web config without directly modifying the web config. Um, to me, I, I really love that feature. Um, you're also going to get your admin interfaces so and and the files that run them right the the acs x's ascx and the aspx's and the cshtml views and whatnot all those things that are going to run the front end of sitecore 
which is going to provide the ability for your non-technical resources to interact with the content. So creating it, removing it, updating it, um, doing the digital marketing stuff with it. Um, it's also going to let your technical, these, these front-end admin interfaces are going to allow your technical resources to create data templates and presentation components that your uh, non-technical resources will consume. And there are multiple flavors of interfaces you get with Sitecore. You get a content editor, which is the way I would describe it is a, a form-based interface where, um, you know, you're basically presented with a form of fields that you can fill out for any particular item. And then you get your page editor, which is more of, let me see what my web page will look like to a visitor, but also let me edit it in line in that view, right? All right, so this is a big slide to me. What don't I get with Sitecore? So you don't get pre-built components for the front end presentation of your website, and you don't get predefined templates for your business's data collection. What? So gonna, wait, wait, wait. We'll have this conversation. What? But this is a big comment. Based on that, Sitecore is best thought of as a platform and not a product. So let's talk about the business implications of this first. As a business person, what does it mean? It means that the minute you install Sitecore or your IT groups installs Sitecore for you or your implementation partner installs it for you, you cannot reasonably expect for your website to be able to be launched the next day. It has to be built. Everything has to be built. You want a menu? It has to be built. We are all aware that in today's world, 99.9% .9 of the websites out there have menus. They all look different. So you are going to have to build the menu for your website on top of Sitecore. Um, from an IT perspective, specifically a developer perspective, this is really a good thing because I know a lot of IT shops, when they hear marketing wants a content management system, they want to bring something in, they're looking at this product, Sitecore, and it's a leader, they start to freak out and sort of say, what am I going to do? Am I going to have a job? Am I going to be relegated to just doing configuration stuff and, and sort of moving pre-built bits back and forth? And, and most developers aren't happy with that. To all the business people out there, developers want to develop. That's, we, we choose to do that because we love it. Um, the good news for them is if you are working with Sitecore, you still get to be a developer. You have to build all of this. Um, I think I've personally seen companies go into a, a Sitecore implementation who don't fully grasp this concept and have had people stand in front of me and say, what do you mean you have to build it? It didn't come with that. And the answer is no, it, it didn't come with that. And yes, it takes time. Yes, it will cost you money to build it, but you will get exactly what you want and we'll be able to tailor it exactly to your custom needs. Um, so yeah, t again, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this slide a moment of silence because it's that important. I'm not, but it's still important. I'm not giving it any silence. I think we need to be loud and boisterous and shout it to the mountaintops, man. Um. There, that was my moment of silence, I guess, because I had a Very good. brain aneurysm or something going on. <laughs> Very good. All right. All right. So on one of the first slides here, we said it's an extensible framework, and then we said you had to build everything. So let's talk about how Sitecore is extensible. So one of the reasons you get so many config files with so many lines is because Sitecore has this notion of pipelines that get defined in the config. And what these basically are, are for each sort of process that Sitecore might do, for instance, uh, an HTTP request coming in or a content editor hitting save to save a content item within the admin interfaces. Um, 
it runs through a series of processes or pipelines. These are all defined in configuration. This gives developers the ability to inject custom processors into pipelines. So you can basically look at it and you can say, okay, if I have a content author, a business user in Sitecore who hits the save button, Sitecore is going to do step A, step B, step C. Cool, that's great, but I needed a step B and a half um, in between B and C, right? You can write your own code. You can, through config, patch that in right between B and C. And now when someone hits save, it's doing A, B, B and a half, which is the worst nomenclature let's call, ever, let's and call C. B, we'll call it B sharp, which is really... B sharp? Well, it's really C. <laughs> um, you can also replace or remove things. So you could say, you know what? I don't really need B. I need B sharp. So you can take out B and put B sharp in. Or you can just say... I don't really need anything special, but I don't want you to do B anymore, and you can just take it out. Um, so that's really powerful. Um, I think, and that's, I would say that's not the most beginner of topics, but when you go from, okay, I figured out how to get the content out of Sitecore onto my front-end website, into, oh... I see this pipeline and I'm customizing it, that's when the world sort of opens up to you, right? Like, that's sort of your mm -hmm. aha moment with Sitecore. Um, at least th that's how I felt about it in yeah. my experience. Yeah, I mean, and, and uh, Sitecore community's good friend John West um, has written, I believe, a few blog posts on the pipeline breakdown. Um, yes. I highly recommend reading those. To understand what's going on. So there's also, um, they have this notion of providers for things like security and search, right? Um, that are configuration based. So here we talk about the patch files that we had mentioned earlier. Um, so this is really cool. Um, the way this works is Sitecore gives you the web config with the, about 4,000 lines in it. And if you think of that as the bottom layer of your 1800 level layer cake that's the bottom it gets put on first then Sitecore gives you a directory where you can put other config files and it'll read through these config files in alphabetical order which is important um, and it'll sort of layer them one by one on top of your web config this way you can replace what was in web config and override it with other options without actually touching web config. You mean like providers? Um, like providers, exactly. So you can leave all of the default pipelines and providers exactly alone as they are in Sitecore's web config, but still modify them through your own patch file that will override it and go on top. Now, we would tell you this is a best practice. Why would we tell you this, Mark? Because when I upgrade, I don't have to go through the headache of giving my computer the middle finger. That is correct. So, when you go through an upgrade, Sitecore is going to give you a list of in directions <clears throat> to update web config. And it's also quite possibly one day going to touch your web config on its own in upgrade process, right? Um, if you've made customizations to that, you might say goodbye to those customizations, and you might not want to say goodbye to those customizations. If you have it in your own separate patch file, guess what? Sitecore is not going to tell you to edit it, and it's not going to touch it itself. So, at the end of the day, after you've upgraded, your customizations are still in place. Yes? We want simplicity of addition. Exactly. And I don't have to use my middle finger anymore. So, I've got Sitecore installed. I think I understand a little bit about it. But hey, I'm an enterprise and I have more than one, one website. Can Sitecore do? Can, <laughs> can, can Sitecore run multiple websites, Mark? Yes, it can. I feel like Bob the Builder. Yes, it can. <laughs> so, yes, it but can. It, there are some challenges. Yes. 
so so this is really important this, this so all right so we'll start at the top yes it can run multiple websites from a single instance there is a gigantic huge caveat about this that again this is something people don't necessarily understand until they're you know a month or two into their site core implementation right and then it's wait what what did you just or, tell me implementation partner or until somebody introduces a memory leak <laughs> yeah um <laughs> So the caveat is all of your websites will actually be run out of one single IIS website. That is one, not two, not three, not ten, one. And one web directory that all run on a single app pool. Mm -hmm. How does it do that? It does it through configuration. Through configuration and through some pipeline methods, mm -hmm. it says, I just got a request. Oh, the request is for site A. I got another request. Oh, this request is for site B, a totally different domain, or possibly not even a different domain, but what you're considering a different website. Um, and, and so it'll... Oh, go ahead. And if you would have read John West's articles by now since we last talked about this, you'd realize that this, that is the site resolver. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. See, I do pay attention. I, I actually was just <laughs> in the site resolver code the other day trying to figure out, and I'd done this in the past and I couldn't remember it. I was mm -hmm. trying to figure out how I could have multiple domains all go back to one single site node in my configuration. Okay. And it is possible they're pipe delimited. Mm -hmm. You literally have to do nothing but separate the domains by a pipe and magic. In the, in the site configuration. Yeah, your your uh, host name property. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so this is really important. So we want to focus on this. This this slide could have almost gotten its own big message, like the other slide did. Um, a single IIS website and a single app pool. What does that mean? That means if you have five high traffic sites on one site core implementation they are all sharing the same resources you may have issues um if you decide i want to take down one of the five of those sites you cannot take it down through iis means without taking the other four down at the same time if you recycle the app pool, you recycle the app pool on all of your sites at once because there's only one app pool running all of them, right? Um, really, really big deal that people don't understand. Well, it, it, it rubs against the paradigm of what web developers using .NET are used to, right? So I can just create sites all day and create DNS records and, you know, set my bindings accordingly and... I could have a field day on one server. Now, if I'm going to run all of my sites off this one site, and we talk about the normal tuning, maintenance, and care of the infrastructure, you know, there's a little bit more that you have to really think about when yes. you're going through that. Um, yes. And now, to be clear, we are talking about using only a single instance of Sitecore. If you are an enterprise level, Personally, I would recommend you get an enterprise license from Sitecore, which will allow you to have multiple instances of Sitecore to run your multiple high-level traffic sites. In that case, you are not confined to this, right? If you have multiple instances of Sitecore, then you can have an app pool per instance and a website per instance. In fact, that's probably the, the better recommended way to go for many Certainly for... Yeah, certainly for enterprises. Um, and, you know, I, I am aware of an enterprise who is putting 1,600 websites on their site core. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you they are not doing it out of a single instance. What? <laughs> and, and those websites, because I know who you're talking about, they're, they're not well-named brands at all that you would never recognize <laughs> on the store shelf. <laughs> And that you would never go to their site to find out more information, like many of millions of people do. Yes. Yeah, put that on one yes. IIS website and let it roll. 
So the point of this is not to scare you away, but just to inform you what you're getting into if you're only going to do it on a single instance. And toilet paper is a heavy traffic creator. <laughs> oh, did I did I give it away? I don't know. No, nah, probably not. <laughs> Are there any beginner best practices for people? So the top bullet point can get you into a religious war. Um... My personal recommendation is that you develop outside of your web group. So after you've installed Sitecore and it's giving you an IIS website that points to a web root, don't do your development base in that web root. Do it somewhere else and set up some sort of automated process that pushes your built source code into that web root. Um, Again, it can be a religious discussion, but in the real world, we seem to find developing out of the web root as a best practice. Um, reduce the edits to your web config as much as possible. We covered this already, right? Mm -hmm. For upgrading, try not to touch web config. Um, sometimes you can't avoid it, but if you can, please do so. Also, <clears throat> because the patch files are processed in alphabetical order, you may find that you want any custom patch file that you create from scratch, you may want to name it with a Z, prefixed with a Z, so that it's the last file process. So what if a thousand of us developers decided to create modules and I'll prefix them with Z? Well, then you're going to have to look at which of those modules you've installed, and if you need to be the last patch, you're going to have to alphabetically go behind them. Z, 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 top. That seems like it could hurt. Well, <laughs> I, just, I, I, I have no answer for you. <laughs> I do. I well, have an answer, yeah. Well, what is your answer? Don't make it hurt. Make it as simplistic as possible and determine what you need to do from a patching standpoint and where that really does fall into lineage. Yes. So it doesn't hurt. There you go. That may mean you have to create multiple patch files, yes? Because you may have something that could go high in the lineage or something that has to go at the end. Well, you definitely want to qualify patch, especially if you're working on modules, right? I'm not, I don't want to... Oh, throw... so, you're, so you're not talking to the new clients. You're talking to module builders. Well, no, no. I mean, it, well, it kind of goes to both, right? Because if I'm going to create custom configurations that I need to put in patch files, it kind of depends what I'm doing, right? Yep. But ultimately, it's going to have some namespace. It's going to have some theme to it that I'm going to need to follow. And if that happens to be AAA, you know, definitely I don't want to have Z, 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 A, 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 A. <laughs> right? I mean, so, it again, planning. It comes down to planning and, and what you're going to do. Yes. And I would definitely take a look at Sitecore's documentation regarding patch files and folders and good stuff. And there's a, um, yep. a few good blogs out there uh, recent, so in the last year, um, regarding experiences with patch files. Yep. I don't remember them off the top of my head if I remember them. We will put them below. Um, Very good. Exactly. Another best practice, and we've, we've hinted at this, um... We recommend you use an experienced Sitecore implementation partner to get started. Um, there's, there can be, like everything, there can be pitfalls with Sitecore development. You will find yourselves much happier and have a product much quicker. You'll get to your goal much quicker, much cheaper, if you work with someone who's already discovered those pitfalls and worked ways around those pitfalls, right? Um if you go it on your own and you're completely new to the world, you're going to make mistakes people have already made, made and already figured out answers to. Um, so we definitely recommend you use an experienced Sitecore implementation partner to get yourself started. Um, and then uh, beyond that, Sitecore does offer both developer and business unit training and certification classes. Um, I would suggest that you send your developers who are going to be working on Sitecore, you send your business users who are going to be exposed to Sitecore to these classes. 
Um, one thing that can catch some clients by surprise is Sitecore itself, Sitecore the entity, the organization, is the only place you can get that official certification training. Um, you can't get it from a third-party site. The other thing, too, if you decide not to proceed with a Sitecore partner on your implementation, you are going to go it on your own. You feel that you have a handle on things. Do not be afraid to leverage the community as a whole. Yes. Um, community.sitecore.net is becoming an ever-increasing great source. Um, blog feeds for Sitecore, uh, you can pretty much trip over them. There's a lot of good posts constantly being put out there. Um, in fact, we talked, uh, we will talk, we talked, one of the two, depending on where it ends up in editing, um, <laughs> about videos and, and master site core and, and, and things like that. So there's plenty of resources to, to take a look at um, yep. in getting started and gaining knowledge as you go forward. Yes, yes. and then I have one more, um, I guess it's an Easter egg best practice. Um, that I thought of right before we started filming, so it didn't make it into the actual uh, presentation here. Um, again, this is sort of my own personal recommendation. I would recommend that every Sitecore implementation is developed as if it was a multi-site implementation from the start. Um, so if you say, I have a single website, I'm going to put it on Sitecore, and that's all today I think I'm ever going to do, I would still recommend you go through the process from the get-go of pretending you had multiple sites and set up your one site as if it was one of many. Um, it's The reason that I recommend that is to start that way is relatively a low-time, low-cost um, endeavor but to not start that way and try to retrofit it in can be a little bit more time consuming and a little bit more costly um, depending how far along the road you are and what you need to switch around and move around. Um, so I just, I would recommend to everyone start as if you were going to do a multi-site implementation. And if you never get that far, you've, what you've basically lost is very little time um, and that's it. It won't. Otherwise, it doesn't hurt you. Well, think of it as a basic business investment. Why, why would you not do this to leverage the investment you've made in your site core ecosystem? Bentleys aren't for getting groceries. You can quote me on that. Bentleys ain't for getting groceries. So, what you got here is a Bentley. Drive it. All right. So. What are some terms I should know if I'm going to go into this whole Sitecore experience thing? Well, you should know the word items. This is the term for content stored in Sitecore. Um, if you go through one of those official training courses, I, at least when I went through it, they hammered in everything is an item. Absolutely everything in Sitecore is at its, at its base an item. Um, so you want to be familiar with that. You also want to be familiar with templates. Um, templates, from my experience, people often think of templates sort of as the visual wireframe, is what I'd say. You hear template, you think of visual thing in front of you. In Sitecore, a template is actually a data construct. It's used to group fields together into a logical object Templates can allow inheritance, all this wonderful stuff that's a little more advanced for an overview. The point I'm trying to make is if somebody tells you a Sitecore template, don't think visual wireframe, think basically database table um, because it's where the content is getting stored and how it is fitting together to get stored. Um, and then the third is presentation components. Okay, these are what is used to build the visual or functional components on the page. So in Sitecore, you can tie your components to ASPX pages, which in Sitecore are called layouts. 
You've got ASCX user controls, which in Sitecore sub layouts. For MVC, you've got controllers or in Sitecore controller renderings and views, which are view renderings and so on and so forth. Um, which brings me to uh, another thing that I kind of wish I would have had the thought of making an actual slide that says this, but Sitecore in its best implementations is a component driven system. Mm. You develop your output web pages in a series of components that you then put together a lot like building Legos. Um, so you basically say, I've got a big green blank board. What pieces do I want to put on top of it to make a masterpiece? And then now that we've got you really excited and given you just the tiniest of taste of what site or where can you go to find out more? So you, can, <laughs> you can go to the Sitecore website, um, which is sitecore.net, not .com. You can go to their documentation site, which is doc.sitecore.net. Fairly new. The new community site, this is community.sitecore.net. Mark just mentioned this. It's it where is, you need to be. Yes, and it's brand new, right? This is, what, two, three weeks old at this point? Yeah, um, time goes by so fast it feels like years. <laughs> but it is Well, new. and it's... It's getting a lot of great usage, which really is really is. good to see. I think the, the, this sounds so cliche, but I think the community has really gravitated towards this. Sitecore, Sitecore did a really good job with this one. Thank you, Sitecore. Yes. And uh, the developers portal is dev.sitecore.net. So those are resources, as Mark said, on top. These are all official Sitecore resources. On top of that, there is plethora of of blogs, um, podcasts, some crazy people are still doing a podcast. Um, Who's that? Crazy, crazy people. Hey, I got some a question. Of... <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have a legitimate question versus a okay. smart question like I've been asking all episode. Okay. Do we know what the future of SDN, the developer network, the old developer network for everything prior to 8, is going to take form? Because honestly... Not that you shouldn't be going to 8, because you should, but let's say perhaps you do not, you're not really going to go to dev.sitecore.net to get what you need. You're going to go back to SDN. So the site that you're referencing, sdn.sitecore.net, is the um, somewhat older um, developer portal for Sitecore, um, which I consider putting up here. I... <laughs> I, I certainly don't have any insider knowledge of this, but I believe Sitecore is trying to sunset it, trying to move things to these new platforms that you're seeing mm -hmm. on the screen in front of you. Yes. Um, you're right. If you're not on Sitecore 8, you may still need to go to the SDN. If you're new to Sitecore, um, personally, I'm not sure you shouldn't go to 8. It's really the flagship product of Sitecore at this point. Um, and I don't know, I don't know, Mark, would you recommend someone who's starting from scratch not starting at 8 at this point? Well, no, I mean, I, everything that I've been putting in from a recommendation standpoint has been 8 update 3 um, right from the get-go here. I think even people that are still back on six and they want to upgrade, you know, even looking at trying to do more of a redesign, re-architect the, the content architecture and kind of go to eight that way versus going through the love fest of upgrade path that can happen. Yeah, yeah really. Seems... Let, let's face it. Everyone is going to end up at eight or later at some point. Save yourself the trouble of having to upgrade to it. Just start there if you're not if you're not already on Sitecore. Yeah, if you're on Sitecore, think about when you want to make that upgrade to actually do more of a lift and go. Um, or, you know, and, and, and think about maybe it's time to do some other changes, not only from a technical foundation, but maybe from look and feel time for a redesign, time to relook at your content architecture. 
Um, if you're going to do those things, then lifting it and moving it as needed and creating basically a new canvas is probably l less painful based on the goals that you want to get out of your redesign content architecture. So again, seek out the experience of a site core implementation partner. Absolutely. Um, I think that's our overview of Sitecore. I ho certainly hope the uh, viewers enjoyed it and at least somebody out there learned something. Yeah, you damn right somebody learned something out there. <laughs> no, um... I believe that's it. All right. Let's stand. If the moose says you're closed, I say you're open. Here's a post from the beta community site that we mentioned in our overview of Sitecore as a wonderful new endeavor for Sitecore. Um, this particular post is about getting HTML content from Sitecore and basically doing something else with it. And it's it's something that caught my attention because I was literally thinking about this uh, the other day. Um, the company that I, I work for um, has a very large infrastructure that's not all built entirely on Sitecore with a lot of... Um, middle tier stuff and I was considering you know I wonder if we would benefit from converting Sitecore from sort of being a top tier uh, website you know platform to being that plus a middle tier sort of content repository deliver right so i guess mark what are your thoughts on you know using sitecore as a content repo we've all had this request i want to use the same content i have in here in other areas and you know we talked earlier about you know this being really an enterprise platform absolutely why if it's an enterprise platform right like an erp system crm why are we not getting other information and doing integrations with it? So, you know, I looked at this too, and I'm, I'm torn to a point, and I'll, I'll talk about why I'm torn. But for the overall concept, yeah, I think absolutely. If you have content and this is your content management system, why aren't you pulling out content? Now, when we're trying to do pure HTML from one source to another, that's where I have a problem. And... It's kind of ugly if you think about what gets put in from a, a standpoint of what's being rendered out. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. <laughs> but I do think there's a need to pull that content out and kind of go and rehash that, redisplay it, replicate it in other places. Do I need to render what I pull out of here or should I just be pulling content and rely on whatever engine I'm pulling it into to render? Should it be treated like information, like an ERP system? that you're trying to import into, let's say, a site core, let's say mm -hmm. into a CRM system. And I think that's, that to me is where I sort of fall in my own questioning about, you know, do I want to develop a middle tier um, content provider service for, for non site core applications is, well, if I do that, it's great in terms of content serving, but as we talked about, if you're using Sitecore solely as a CMS and not using its digital marketing capabilities, are you kind of missing some of the big boat that you want to be on? And so then it gets into, okay, well, if I'm going to go that far, then I'd better develop the same, you know, middle tier methods that allow me to reuse the marketing or utilize the marketing capabilities of Sitecore, at which point... I'm getting close to kind of rewriting Sitecore instead of just using Sitecore, right? Well, would an FXM kind of come into play? Let's say I had a series of promos that I want to use across multiple channels, mm -hmm. right? Not just in my content management. There's yep. a perfect example of how I want something rendered out. I don't really care about what my template, you know, fields say as much as I do. I want the same look and feel for this promo. And That's when true. somebody clicks on it over here, I want it to track back into my analytics, you yes. know, somehow, some way, get that merged in and get on my contact card and, and, and do really well. Yep. That's a whole different thing. But <clears throat> I think um, that's where you'd want kind of that rendering engine to be consistent. And you talked about that middle tier, and I think that would that's where it would be valuable. And then FXM kind of comes into play, too, because it is now an external site, you know, that you could be doing that, too. 
Yep. So that I definitely see just so much advantage to that. It's where if I uh, do an About Us page, like mm-hmm. our About Us page is on our website, right? Mm-hmm. And I want to use that maybe for Facebook, our Facebook instance. If I want to use that maybe in, maybe we spin off another podcast. Because one's not enough? Because one's not enough. <laughs> And, and we use, you know, portions of the bio, right? So I'm actually now, I'm really going after the web API getting fields, but is it going to have the same look and feel? Mm-hmm. So that's where the web API really comes into use for me. And, and you know, that model's already there to, to authenticate and, and pull from and, and do what we need to do. Yep. So, but am I ever going to really render out my About Us page like I would on my original site? Yeah, I mean, your use case would be something where, you know, where we've seen it, right, is, well, I've got my my enterprise public-facing site on Sitecore, but for whatever reason, I still have my blog or my um, recruiter portal or some sort of portal on a different technology, but I want that technology to make, look like it's the exact same look and feel, right? Yeah. That's yeah. sort of the use case is like, well, I need at least my header and footer, and if I up, update a link in my header on my Sitecore side, I want my other third-party sides that look the same to get that update in real time. You know, there's a request or a requirement to do this. Send the HTML of a page to a different source. Right, so there's obviously a specific case here that we don't understand fully, mm-hmm. um, but you know that is the requirement. And I think later on they talked about using an uh, HTTP, HTTP or HTML utility to parse it out, um, you know, to break that apart. Yep. Again, you know, I could see again that promo or something specific to go around, and maybe that's something that needs to be thought about a little bit i don't know but right just so general I, html i'm just not sure i just i still can't understand the case i'd want to do that with right i've been in the situation um where i have built components that sort of do the opposite of this where i want to get content that's on the web into my site core site somehow and what i end up do is scraping it right um And that has its problems, too, as opposed to, like, what you're talking about here is I'm going to push content out to you, and you can just consume it, whereas with a scraper, you're kind of pulling the content. Yeah. The the issue you run into with a scraper is as soon as that content that you're scraping changes its format from what you were expecting, you probably have unpredictable results on your side. And you're sort of at the mercy of whoever or whatever it is you're scraping. Um, so at least in this case, by pushing, you're putting the onus on the person who's actually doing the action. Um, and hopefully they don't break the other side, right? Um, <clears throat> so I'm torn. I think I want to see it. You know, I think I want to see an easier way to do it, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, I don't. I can be wishy-washy, oh. right? Sure. I can that's, float on. That's, I can ride that fence all day. That's why this post hasn't been answered yet. I don't know. It definitely, the content should be another resource in the arsenal of the enterprise. Yep. Just like ERP information containing product information, customer planning, well, and materials. As as developers, we like to stay dry, right? We we like to not repeat ourselves so much yeah yeah well why should we expect anything different from content authors right they shouldn't have to repeat themselves either there's a reason yeah. we don't do it so i'll buy that i'm still torn but i think i'm leaning toward i'd love to have the ability to, to just do segments of it and not so much a re-render of everything an entire but, page i think but, that makes sense and grab my information as I need it in a clean, appropriate way. Yes. I think right. we can agree to that. Cool. Very cool. Hopefully the community agrees as well, or disagrees. And I'm lets okay. us know about it, either yeah. way. Uh, I'm okay with disagreements. <laughs> I'm not that bright. Everyone knows that. I'm bright enough. 
How's that? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, man. I think that's a wrap then. All right. Until next time, don't forget to publish. <laughs>